Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 285. I'm Lisa Louise Kerr. If you want to find out about your family history, one of the best places to go is the resting place of your ancestors, cemetery. And today I've invited an expert on the subject that can help you plan your visit, uh, help you figure out the meaning behind the things that you're going to be seeing while you're there. And she's also going to share with us some of the strangest things that she's run into on her own travels to various cemeteries across the country. Uh, My guest is Joy Neighbors, and she's the author of the book, The Family Tree Cemetery Field Guide, and the popular blog, it's called A Grave Interest. So I am so happy to welcome to the show the tombstone tourist, Joy Neighbors. Hi, Joy. Hi, Lisa. Thank you so much. Great to see you. You know, I think the last time we saw each other in person, I had you on the Genealogy Gems podcast was out Roots Tech in Salt Lake City. It um, was. That was, that was so a much great fun. Time. It was. And, I, you know, and you're like me, you, you were traveling an awful lot uh, not too long ago. And uh, I know that you kind of live on the road, don't you? Tell everybody where you are. I do. Well, as you can see, it is my kitchen behind me. We live in a 40-foot RV. So wow. when you put the slide outs out, it's like a mini apartment. And we've done this for about five years. Um, we have a home base in the Hoosier National Forest in southern mm-hmm. Indiana. So that's where I am right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you could join me. People love to hit the road and, and visit and do their research. For somebody who maybe, though, has perhaps attended a funeral, but they've never actually gone in person and really made a research trip out of going to the cemetery. It's a little bit of a different uh, visit. So I, I, I can see you're, you're very prepared because you live in your RV and can just pull right up. But tell folks, what should they be packing in their backpack to take with them to make sure they've got everything that they need? Okay, I actually have um, a cemetery bag. Oh. And <laughs> What is really cool is when you start deciding you're going to go do this and you make your decision what cemeteries you're going to go to, you get your map, everything's all coordinated. Schedule your appointments. I always want to stress that before you head out. We're looking at um, genealogy societies, historical groups, and definitely with the sexton or the superintendent of the cemetery. Because if you give them a little uh, heads up that you're coming, they'll be able to pull that information for the ancestors that you're searching for. And then they may sometimes come up with some cool little tidbits you didn't know along the way. You're putting the bag together though. You want to be sure you have some very soft brushes. So we're looking at like very soft paint brushes, a soft toothbrush. That's so you can clean the debris off that stone. You can clean out the lettering and see what it is. Take a water bottle. You never know when something's caked on and you need to kind of move it along a little. Very, very um, soft plastic, using it uh, as like a paint scraper to get some of that grass and that ivy. They love to kind of cover over those graves. And sometimes it's tough to make out what that grave says or even get the exact shape of it. Some of them fall in and get covered over. So go ahead and and do a little bit of... um, respectful cleaning, if you can, to see what that says. Uh, You're also, my number one thing is to take a camera and batteries and lots of batteries. (laughs) Uh, If you have gone to the cemetery, you may have noticed that your batteries um, kind of drain. They kind of fade away on you quickly. Now, I've been given several reasons for that. Uh, If it's winter, it's cold. So that's pulling some of the energy out. Um, less current is going through for whatever reason. Maybe you need to clean the, the um, connections. LCD monitors soak up a lot of that uh, energy also. And of course, spirits are draining the energy so that they can manifest. And um, I've, I think, had every one of those situations happen. So I carry a bag of AA batteries because you can use your phone and that's great, but I'm old fashioned. So I take the old fashioned digital camera and take shots so that I can come back and kind of play with it in my, my iPhoto and, and have some fun with them and read some of those letters that you can't make out when you're there. 
Well, but, it is tempting to, to use your phone, isn't it? But uh, I have a digital camera and I'm Every time I use it, I go, oh, that's right. This thing takes way bigger, more higher resolution pictures, which means I have a lot more to work with if I do need to kind of do some corrections to be able to read the stone. You do. And you also have, um, if you're like me on the desktop, you have family folders everywhere where you can stash the photos that go with that person. And then you don't have to go back and kind of go through that roll and see if you can find that again, because you have that dupe over there. In the folder, you can pull out and take a look and match up with what you need to. It's also, for me, easier if you're submitting to find a grave or billion graves. You've got it right there, and you can put it right on the website and put the info you want from that folder. And it's just more convenient for me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Now, you were talking about some of the tools that you bring in this bag, and it and it sounds like, really, you always start with less is more when it comes to approaching the stone and trying to get it cleaned up so that you can look at it. Um, talk a little bit more about that, because I know for a while there, it was very popular to take a big thing of chalk and scrape all over it and try to read. The, you know, And we've learned an awful lot, haven't we, about what could damage the stones? We have. Um, I just finished an article for Family Tree. It'll come out in October, talking about literally how to enhance those stones so that you can read them easier. Uh, water bottle is your best friend because a lot of times that you can wet that stone, it makes that a little darker and you can read more what that text says. Uh, carry a small mirror and you can take your phone and you can turn that flashlight on, shine some light on it. And right. or you can take the mirror and kind of catch some sunlight and you can actually read a little bit better if it's sharper, kind of like as you get older, you need a little more light in the restaurant to read the menu. It works yes. the same way at the cemetery. And it really does help to bring some of that lettering, some of that writing out, it makes it more distinctive. Yeah, I even have a, um, I have it here somewhere. It's a ring, it clips on your phone. And I guess it's a selfie ring. So you've got a little extra light, but it's great for <laughs> pointing at this tombstone as well. I like it. I hadn't heard of that. Yeah, just kind of gives you a little little extra oomph. Now, you, you really quickly mentioned about making the appointment. And I want to talk a little bit about that because this is probably the part that gets a little intimidating um, because we, we don't want to show up and get turned away or, you know, it's not open or they, they just go, oh, no, 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 we don't help people who want to do genealogy. Who is the person at the cemetery? You mentioned the sexton, but talk a little bit about it. when we make a phone call and we want to verify, are you open? May I come in? Uh, do you have any records? Who should we be asking for in this phone call? Okay, when you get the person at the cemetery, uh, usually if it's a larger cemetery, you're going to be getting um, a secretary, per se, someone who knows basically where things are stored. And if you're looking at something that's going to be a little more in depth, you can ask for the cemetery superintendent. Now, many times that person will not be available, especially if it's a larger cemetery and they have a lot of funerals going on and they're coordinating things. But the people behind those desks are wonderful. And if you tell them, I'm looking for a great, great grandfather, here's the name, here are the dates roughly, those people go out of their way to help you. Um, when I was doing my book, uh, I got hold of the cemetery superintendent at um, Oak Grove, Oak Hill Cemetery, so many oaks in the cemeteries yeah. the cemetery <laughs> in Evansville, Indiana. And I told oh. him I'd like to shoot uh, some of the different forms to put in the book. So I went over and met him one morning and it was this big, gorgeous, like an art deco building, an mm. old home. And so he said, well, I hope you wore grubby clothes because we're going to go up in the attic. And I uh, no one had been up there in years. There was dust everywhere. We cleaned off places to sit. And he brought out files, um, everything from a file, just a folder, to actually he had cabinets, to he had boxes that were just scraps of paper. Each cemetery sexton or superintendent kept the records differently. Some used the forms. Mm -hmm. Some just made notes. Uh, one gentleman made notes. Every cemetery or excuse me, every, uh, the funeral he oversaw at the cemetery, he wrote down what the weather was. 
Uh, he took a note of who was attending. It was a small town. So he knew that the daughter was here, the sister was here, the, the grandchildren attended. And he kept a nice little running commentary going in each note and just wrote it on scraps of paper and put it in the drawer. So I thought that was so, um, so quaint, so sweet that he cared that much about every time he had a funeral that he made those notes. And if you were someone who had someone buried at that time, you would be able to see those notes and see what he had written about that, about that graveside service. But you had to know to ask. Because there's so much going on. They may not say, well, we have these scraps of paper. But if you ask, is there anything else you might have on my ancestor? Are there any extra books or notations? That may ring a bell and that may help them actually realize, oh, yeah, I think we might. I'll look and see. So when you show up, they'll have that info there for you. That's awesome. Oh, my gosh, your heart must just been like, oh, I get to go in the attic. Ooh. <laughs> that, that would be me, you know, just like, oh, I get to touch things. I remember going to a cemetery in um, the San Joaquin Valley in California, and where my grandparents are buried and her parents are buried. And uh, calling ahead really helped because uh, they had people who it was such a small cemetery, it was, they were only part time. Right. So you can't just show up normal eight to five. It was only on the days and the times that they were there. But when I got there, it was really encouraging. Uh, the gentleman said, oh, no, honey, this is the best part of my job. This is the, the happy part of my job is that, you know, I get to make because I worried about interrupting them and that kind of thing. You know, when I first got started and um, I think that it is it is kind of the the fun, joyful part of their job is that they have family members and they're going to make them so happy being able to provide information. In his, in this case, he went to a big old file cabinet and, and they had a folder on every person. And when he opened it, they had clipped, I think, the obituary of my great grandmother out of the newspaper. They had handwritten stuff. They had official documents. I was like, that's amazing. Cause I don't think they were obligated to keep all of that, but Every single one is different, isn't it? It is. Uh, some are very by the book, almost, yeah. you would say, sterile. And some, just like you said, they've, they've kept all kinds of little extras, things that were in the paper and, and just little notations, memorial cards. You know, if there's a memorial card for the graveside service, I found those tucked in there, too. It's just, it depends on, I guess you could say, how caring that superintendent was, how how connected to his job or her job. And it's great when you find somebody that really, really did uh, understand and want to share this farther down the road, not really knowing that that might happen, but they kept the extra goodies anyway. And that makes it so much fun. Exactly. I think too, uh, one of the tips I would probably tell people is that allow a lot of time. I don't know about what you have encountered, but I have found I need to take a big deep breath and just chill because they may be on a different schedule <laughs> than I am. And so, you know, you don't show up with 10 minutes, I gotta go, what do you got? Um, I remember I've got photographs my husband took of me just standing in the doorway and I'm like, I got all day, you know, cause the guy was like, well, you know, and he wanted to tell me stories and all this stuff, but that's part of the joy of it, isn't it? It is. And they do have stories to tell. Yeah. Um, they can give you information on these cemeteries. And like you said, even the smaller ones are great because they do spend a little more time. And they'll tell you if you've been out and you've looked at the cemetery and you've seen. Um, there's one cemetery where I, st I saw a stone that just said unknown. And so wow. I asked, what's, what's the stone marked unknown? Well, that was a gentleman in the early 20th century who had come to town. He'd gotten off the riverboat there in the town, and he had wandered around a few days and gotten sick. Oh. And he had stayed at the local um, hotel, and when they knew he was sick, they called the doctor in, and the doctor tried to do what he could, and the man died. And they didn't know who he was. They didn't know where he came from. He shared no personal information at all all they wow. couldn't find anything in his effects and so the town chipped in together and they had him buried in the cemetery and all they could put on the stone was unknown he was just uh 
a vagabond who passed through town and happened to die. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a, a heartwarming story. The town cared, and so they wanted him remembered in some fashion. So when they buried him, they put up a very nice stone that simply said, unknown. So if you yeah. always, if you see things and you ask questions, they are more than happy to tell you the stories, and they do know the stories. Exactly. So when you get there, uh, I know some cemeteries will have a map, or they'll be able to tell you the row and the plot number and that kind of thing. Do you have kind of a, a plan of attack in terms of particularly if you don't get access to that, how you go about making sure you've covered everything, but make the best use of your time in terms of trying to locate people in the cemetery. Any tips on that? The first thing I will do, even if it's a large cemetery, uh, is make a drive around. Now, stopping and getting the maps, always, always helpful if it's large. But if it's a small cemetery, you can make that drive pretty quickly. Uh, just kind of get an idea north, south, where you're heading. If you have called ahead, they may have been able to give you um, coordinates or the section lot number where your relative is that you're looking for. So you can find that. That's my second stop. My first stop is always the office and do a drive through and then make that visit. Uh, anyone who's done that, as you said, it's one of those moments. There's so much emotion. Mm -hmm. uh, you find that grave. I was looking for my great grandmother and it was difficult. I, she died when I was 10 and I remember a very long drive. And I thought the name was Beetle, like the bug cemetery. And after a lot of research, we found out it was called Bedell. And it was oh. in another county. And when I was driving up that hill, I suddenly, I knew where I was. And I got out and just standing at the foot of her grave was so emotional for me because this was my person. And I had found her. And I also found her husband, which was my great-grandfather. He passed about 20 years before I was born. But she always told me I reminded her of him. And on the other side was a child I had never heard of. Um, my great-grandmother had had seven children. My grandma had talked about them. But she had never mentioned a brother named Jesse. And it was not until uh, I had a cousin contact me from Michigan because of our DNA. And she had the story on Jesse. And Jesse had been uh, a special needs child. So he had never gone to school. He had never worked in the farm. And she had, when he died, a letter that someone close to the family had written about him, talking about his sweet personality and how he was always there uh, to greet people when they came and how how joyful he was. And I thought, you know, I didn't even know about this child. And now I have, because someone took the time to make that letter, I now have some information about him and can put that whole family together more completely. So it's amazing when you go, you never know what you'll find. And cluster research is something, you know, that we all kind of go, oh, okay, take some other photos around. But when I stood up, and I looked cat a corner from their graves. There were my paternal great grandparents. Now, how my maternal great grandparents and my paternal great grandparents ended up buried in the same cemetery that has nothing to do with our family, I don't know. But that's that's one of those odd, you know, genealogy mysteries that you get to dig into in the winter when it's cold and you don't have other things calling or pressing. But it's amazing. I mean, it's just stunning how much history is there and how much you can find uh, your family or their, their in-laws. You can find the neighbors. You can find the folks they went to church with and start building their life out and getting more of a sense of who they really were just from that cemetery visit. That's a great point. And if you're looking for somebody and you're not finding them right away, particularly in those larger cemeteries, uh, I like that idea. You stand there with the one you know, kind of just soak it in, and then you walk all the way around, and you realize that people were connected. They may not be buried right next door, but there's going to be some kind of connection and rhyme and reason, and uh, just working your way out from the known tombstone 
to the around it, you may find more people that you didn't even realize were also buried there. So that's neat. You know, you remind me of, um, in fact, it was Indiana. Now that I think about it, Joy, it was that uh, I was speaking at FGS when it was in, I think, Fort Wayne, Indiana, a couple of years ago. And we stopped because my mother's side of the family was uh, from Indiana and Ohio, Union City. And so I, t- I told my daughter and my husband, well, we have to go to the cemetery. Uh, <laughs> I thought we were going to a conference. Well, we went to, a, of course, we went to cemetery. <laughs> yeah. And we found it finally. It wasn't that big. It was out in the country, an agricultural area. And when we, we came in, and I, I swear, we looked at every stone. I have a video of my daughter looking at every stone and walking up and down. Just like when you were a kid, remember? Yeah, that was miserable. <laughs> you love going through cemeteries. And look, there's a rainbow. There is. You're meant to find Henry Burkett. I'm, I'm trying. If anybody could find him, you could. I'm trying. And it was starting to rain, and we almost gave up. We got back to the car, and I remember just standing there and just being very quiet and saying, I know you're probably here, and I know you'd like me to find you, right? And I turned and I looked and right next we had parked on a little road that actually went into this very small cemetery parked and I turned and Henry Burkett's tombstone was right there next to the wheel of my car so what happened we parked right next to them and we started wandering around and couldn't find them we covered the whole cemetery and then we came back and there and they then were right there they were and how close um that close <laughs> we were close, Hannah. Not happy. I'm not. I'm not laughing about it. I, and I had looked at everything else because you, you know, your instinct is to run out of the car and go spread out. <laughs> and no, he had brought me right there. And there's Henry, and then there's Jane, and there. Oh my gosh, I was just floored. Tell me, I am pretty sure, because I've heard other stories, I am not the only person who's had those kinds of things where you could look back and go, you can't help but feel like your ancestors were saying, come here, come here, just quiet down and pay attention. I'll tell you where I am. That is so true. Uh, It's just like you said, if you will stand there and you'll look around and you literally, for me, it's like, okay, where are you? I, I can't find you. Where are you? And just follow the hunch, follow the instinct, the lead. And eventually you're going to find somebody that you go, oh, oh, I know that name. And I know that name. Now it makes sense. And it's trail. And sometimes you get really lucky like you did. And there they (laughs) are. My ancestors continue to blow my socks off. That's for sure. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present, and future. The MyHeritage DNA kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. You'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. Today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com, your go-to resource for unlocking the stories of your ancestors. Dive into the newspapers where your family's history unfolds as you search nearly a billion pages in seconds. Newspapers.com offers an unparalleled treasure trove of historical newspapers that provide a window into the past. 
With papers from the 17th century all the way to today, newspapers.com is the largest online newspaper archive. It's really a gold mine for anyone who's looking to uncover stories from the past. Whether you're a seasoned genealogist or you're just starting your genealogy journey, newspapers.com really makes it easy to search for obituaries, birth announcements, and the everyday stories that shaped your family. It's kind of like having a time machine at your fingertips. And here's the best part. Our listeners here at Genealogy Gems get an exclusive offer. Use promo code GENEALOGYGEMS for a 20% discount on your subscription. That's Genealogy Gems. No spaces, just all together. Genealogy Gems at newspapers.com. Sign up today at newspapers.com and embark on a journey of discovery. So let's look at the tombstones because one of the things I know that you've written about quite a bit in your book, which I think is fascinating, are some of the symbols that we see on tombstones. You know, we get names, we get information, but tell folks, what will they perhaps be seeing and what are some of the most common symbols? What do they mean? You will find a lot of religious symbols. Um, of course, there are all different kinds of crosses uh, with with different meanings. Uh, there's the Greek cross, which just looks like a plus sign. Uh, you can also find um, the, the crucifix, which is the, um, the cross with Jesus hanging on it, which is Catholic. Um, and you also find sometimes the cross will have like IHS on it, which is a Latin and that's an abbreviation for Jesus, Savior of Mankind. There's the Fleur de Lis or the iconic cross, which has the really um, beautiful Fleur de Lis at the tips. That is usually put on the stone of a mother. So if you find that, you may find um, the matriarch of the family buried there. There are also a lot of angels. And angels are said to intercede for mankind. And archways are another one that are used to mark the graves of couples. So you may see an archway. A lot of them are stone, but I found one at Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville, Kentucky. And you could open the gate. It was just amazing. You could walk through the archway. So a, a lot of people have put some thought and some time into some of these designs that really, really should be appreciated. Um, There's a lot of animals in the cemetery too. Mausoleums usually have the two lions or they may have sphinx that are guarding eternal rest. Dogs are very popular. Many times they may just be a statue of a dog laying by the stone. And that's always showing uh, the animal that is vigilant and loyal through death. There is a Highland Cemetery in Terre Haute, Indiana, and there is a mausoleum to John Hinkle. Now, he did not have a stone dog put on the steps of the mausoleum. His dog, who was called Stiffy Green, actually went there when he died. He went everywhere with John. And when John passed uh, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, Stiffy literally sat there and mourned himself to death. And the family was so touched. They called a taxidermist and then they took Stiffy and they put him inside the mausoleum so that he could be with John and guard him forever. Wow. And after a while, the cemetery personnel always look in and check on things. And Stiffy had moved. So the rumor started, Stiffy was moving around in the mausoleum and then people were hearing barking and it grew and grew until the 1970s and there was a college close by. And so it was a dare to run up to the Hinkle Cemetery at night and look in. Someone took a shotgun and shot out Stiffy's eye. And then the cemetery said, okay, we've, we've got to stop. Stiffy has to go. So the Vigo County Historical Society and the Lions Club got together. They repaired Stiffy. They gave him a new eye and they put him in the Vigo County Historical Museum. They built a replica of John's mausoleum and put him in there. And so that is where you can go today and see Stiffy in the replica uh, patched up. But they still say at the cemetery late at night in the autumn, 
you can smell John's pipe smoke and you can see Stiffy and him wandering along the hills just at twilight and you can hear Stiffy bark. So I always love that story. That's that is vigilant and that is loyal and that's what our dogs are. And when you see those in the cemetery, I always wonder what other dogs are wandering around with their masters that we don't know the story of. Exactly. That's, that's a great one. Oh my gosh. Now, we do have the number one symbol you're going to see is a dove. Oh. And so birds uh, basically represent the flight of the soul. And we had um, Mother's Day. We lost my mother-in-law. And she went with me. She was at Roots Tech with me. She went with me on all kind of genealogy, uh, speaking trips and adventures. And when she passed, my husband and I were sitting over here at, at the dining table on Saturday evening, and I looked out, and there was a dove out on a branch. And we talked about 10 minutes, and I looked, and the dove is still sitting there. And so about 20 minutes later, I said, you know, that dove is still out there. And your mom knows the story, and I'm kind of thinking that might be her. And it was just that, how touching, you know, she would know what a dove would represent. And we have never had that happen before or since. So it's kind of cool. You when you lose someone, you kind of look for signs and it's like, I think that was a sign from her was the dub. So that's, that's kind of taken on a, a special meaning for me in the cemetery now. Gosh, there's so many others, lambs, mm -hmm. uh, especially the older cemeteries where you'll have the stones from the 1800s and you'll see a, one lamb, you may see two lambs. There is a cemetery in Southern Illinois that has one stone and it's a square with four lambs. And so I took down the information and I came back and did some research on that. And the family lost all four children in one summer. And that was due to a cholera epidemic that swept through that county. So when you find the symbols and you do a little more research, it even puts more of their history and their story together. That's why I love the symbols and I love finding something that I haven't seen before. So I can come back and kind of do that exploration and research. And you get more of a story of who that person was that really no one other than the family would ever know. Mm -hmm. And you kind of restore that story back yeah. to the world. You know, and that's what makes you a good uh, genealogist and a researcher. And I think that's what you know brings a lot of people to genealogy is that curiosity. Um, you know, it got most of us in trouble as kids, but as now, <laughs> as genealogists, not just not noticing something, which I think is part of it, you, you want to be pay attention so you do notice, but then to take action and go find out what does that mean? So many things, there are meanings behind it and reasons why things happen. Not everything is as haphazard as it looks, is it? It isn't. Um, there is a stone in Sullivan County, Indiana. I found it years and years ago, maybe eight, 10 years ago. And it looked like a knight on horseback. Okay, now this is Indiana. And as you know, we didn't have those. So I went <laughs> and there was a little inscription. And the woman's name was Jane Todd Crawford. And she had died in 1842. And they had put up this huge stone. And I, I, there was a little bit of a story about how she had died and why it was being memorialized. So I started doing research on this. Now, at one point in time, my husband and I were in Richmond, Kentucky. And so the story was in 1809, Jane thought she was pregnant, uh, but it wasn't, the baby wasn't coming. She had reached past term. So she thought she had a stone baby, which meant that the, mm. the, it had died inside of her. Right. This doctor came from Danville, Kentucky, it was 60 miles on horseback in winter. He examined her and told her she had an ovarian tumor and he judged it to be about 20 pounds. It would literally crush her to death inside. And she asked if he could do anything. And he said, yes, I believe you can spay a woman like you do a farm animal. And no one has ever done this. Uh, the people are terrified of the thought, but if you're willing to let me experiment, I think I can save your life. And Jane agreed. And she went with uh, a person who was helping her over by horseback to the doctor's home in Danville. It took them several days. 
and he operated on Christmas morning. And there were people who found out and they have a noose hanging on a tree outside and they are shouting, you know, death to the doctor. And it was, it was just horrible. And Jane saw this and she still went and she laid down on that board in a bedroom and let him make a nine inch incision Mm. and literally break that tumor apart and take it out. And she survived. She lived to be 73. And this happened when she was uh, in her early forties. And I found out the story and I wrote about it and I realized this wasn't really a part of Kentucky history. Nobody knew this story. So um, I took an MFA, I got an MFA and I took a playwriting class and I literally wrote um, a full act play about Jane and what happened and how she lived through it. And so it's just what you said. These people get hold of you and hold of your imagination and you want to tell that story. And I still want to get her um, some recognition of uh, she's the reason we have abdominal surgery now. She was willing to be that guinea pig, right. even though the odds were not in her favor. And just because the doctor, when he took out the entrails, kept them warm in warm water was the reason she survived. Wow! And so it's amazing. Uh, there's a statue to Ephraim McDowell, the doctor, uh, in the Hall of Statuary in Washington, D.C., but there's nothing for Jane. So <laughs> still fighting to get Jane acknowledged for what all she did. Absolutely. Just being willing. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, and that leads me to one of the things I wanted to ask you about before I let you go is um, I know you've written for me over at the Genealogy Gems uh, blog that about some of the unusual things that you've run into. And you've been so gracious in sharing some of those stories. Um, I think some of the ones that are really interesting to me is also unusual places we would find cemeteries. I mean, the basic ones, the public ones, that's all fine and good. But the further back you go in time, you find that they could be in the back corner of somebody's property on private property. But you have found um, some unusual ones. Tell folks about there was a uh, tombstone in the middle of the road, as I recall. (laughs) Uh, that was in Indiana. Oh, and okay. It, it, seriously. <laughs> or who's your roots? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, it, it was located, I can't remember the name of the road right now, but it was a county road. And what happened, uh, it was the early mid 1800s, and it was a farming family, and the woman died, childbirth. And so she was buried on a plot of land right there on the farm. And as years went on, the county decided that would be the perfect road to go between uh, Indianapolis and another town. And so they went to the family. Uh, They purchased land from other farms around and they went to this family and said, we would like to purchase this um, plot of land to, to put a road through. And by that time, the father had passed, the son had passed, and it was the grandson. And he said, no, my grandmother is buried there and I will not sell it. Well, we're going to take um, or we'll exhume the family bodies from all the other farms and we're going to take them and put them over to the cemetery. And the grandson said, no, she stays where she's buried. And what was interesting is he was afraid the county was going to just show up and do it. So he was sitting on her grave when they appeared and he had a shotgun. And he told them they had a choice. They could try to move him and take the risk or they could leave her there. And they got together. They had a very short talk and decided they would pave the road around her grave. And they literally did that. It's a straight road till you get to her grave. And then it goes around it and joins back up into a straight road. And it's still that way to this day. Now, About five years ago, they came in. It was, I mean, it was large. It was a hill that, you know, you could see the plaque and you could walk up to. And about five years ago, they leveled it even with the highway. It still routes around, but they said it was becoming such um, a traffic problem. People would stop. They'd read the marker. It was causing problems. So they leveled it. 
so that no one would run into the grave, which had happened a few times. So for safety's sake, it literally did have to eventually be level, but it is still where you have the road that goes around it. So they did, they did honor uh, basically the part of what they were doing, but they did bring it down. So it isn't as obvious it's there anymore. (laughs) That's an amazing story. I I think about we are saying how some of the cemeteries are actually on people's property or in the back 40 of their property, whatever. Yeah. You gotta be careful of the shotguns. So tell us what, what other kind of unusual cemeteries have you run into in your research? Um, we were out one afternoon. Uh, my husband's really good about this. You know, I'll look something up on GPS and go, Oh, it's here. And, and we ended up way out in the country uh, in Illinois and we drove up this long lane to a farmhouse and I said, this should be Adam's cemetery. And he went and knocked on the door. And of course it was, you know, they're having fried chicken and it's in the summer and you know, want to come in and we're like, no, we're fine. We're fine. We're looking for the cemetery. And the guy said, well, if you let me finish, I'll take you to it. So we waited and he came out in about half an hour and he said, hop on the four wheeler. And his wife came out And we got on the four-wheeler and the dogs went with us and it was a ride. I mean, we crossed ditches and we went up hills and we went into the woods and there were about eight tombstones and they had taken upon themselves to keep this area cleared. So they were bringing up the lawnmower and they were mowing and they were trimming the weeds around these stones. They they had no relation uh, to the Adams who were buried there. And they hadn't had anyone come and look for the cemetery in years. And so they were so gracious and so much fun just to take us up there and let us explore and see what we had found. So if you go and there's a house or a barn, something there that somebody is still taking care of that property, ask them if you can go, if they know where the cemetery is, if you can go see it or find out who owns that land and see if they can get you to where that cemetery is. Because a lot of times people are still caretaking it. Now, there are some states that now require if you purchase land and a cemetery is on it, and a cemetery can be one stone. If there is someone buried there, in some states you have to take care of that land. In other states, you don't. And I went looking for a cemetery one time, could not find it. Uh, And my mother-in-law happened to know what happened. And we went early one morning. Uh, We went in the back way. And she showed me what was left. It had been purchased by a hog farmer. And he did not care that it was a cemetery and had taken all the stones up and laid them face down in the mud and had made a path to his hog barn. And so the fact that we went in the back route, she showed me where it was, and you could still see a few of the stones were there. So if it's a state where they don't have to respect it, a lot of times people don't. And we've lost a cemetery and we've lost the history. And all you can hope is that maybe some records made it to a genealogy society or a historical organization. Otherwise, they're gone. And we just have no way to retrace that because someone didn't care enough to try to preserve that burial grant. Wow, it's amazing. It makes you realize that you know, it wouldn't hurt to get in touch with our own local historical society or genealogical society. Uh, oftentimes they kind of organize vo- volunteer groups who will help as well kind of restore and, and caretake, don't they? They do. And it's, you know, if you go out on that, you don't have to know a thing about what you're doing. They will show you what to do, um, how you can clean a grave, how you can tend a grave. We have Memorial Day coming up. Mm -hmm. And that's something um, I remember being a very small child and my grandmother taking me out to tend the day, uh, tend the graves. It was decoration day. So I can remember doing that. I can remember us having a picnic in the cemetery, which a lot of people find rather bizarre, but they're so restful. They're beautiful. There is so much artwork, uh, sculpture by well-known sculptors in some of these larger cemeteries. Lewis Comfort Tiffany did some of the stained glass 
in some of the mausoleums uh, in Rochester, New York. Frank Lloyd Wright did uh, mausoleums for some of the cemeteries in Chicago, who was a well-known architect in the early 1900s. There is really um, art museum quality work in our cemeteries, but you just have to take the time and go out and walk and look. Exactly. And they should take your field guide with them. Tell us a little bit about the book. How's the book going to help folks as they make their way out and travel to cemeteries? What is so cool, and of course, I'm sitting in my office, so yes, I have a copy. Excellent. (laughs) But really, I was thrilled. Um, Family Tree Magazine um, wanted this put together. They contacted me, and I have always wanted to do a book. And they made it so you can slip it in your cemetery bag and it washes off. This is not something, you know, you have to treat carefully. There is a place in the back for notes. It tells you uh, how you can list things as you're seeing it. You can write down the symbols. You can go back and do your research. And we've laid it out into four parts, basically getting you ready to go to the cemetery Uh, Then what you do once you're there, what you're looking for, the records that you could find in the cemetery, which will also lead you to other records that will contain death information and information on relatives that you may not have thought of. Then what do you do with it when you get back home? Um, One thing I always want to encourage people to do is share it. Put it on find a grave, put it on billion graves. Um, If you're on Ancestry, Put it out there. Put it on family search. Let other people know the information you found so that we can all continue to build our family trees together. Uh, Just like my cousin in Michigan who contacted me through DNA. She had information I have never known photos I had never seen. And I did for her. So there's a wealth of information. You hit a brick wall. Now you got to start looking. Who else could have that information? How else could I put that together and make sense out of it? Because somewhere there's a clue. It's, it's like being Nancy Drew and you've got to, you know, <laughs> investigate where it's leading. You're not going to open it, are you? Certainly. Come on. There's always a clue that leads to something else, to something else, to someone else, to somewhere else. And eventually you'll get that information. Absolutely. And you're the perfect guide. I will, um, in the show notes for this episode, I'm going to have a link to Joy's book. So those of you watching can get it. It really is super helpful. You're going to get so much more out of a visit that you make. And of course, uh, tell folks where they can read what you've been up to lately on your um, grave interest. I, uh, I started the blog. Uh, My husband and I had a winery for a decade in Illinois. Session hit. We had to close. And so he said, well, well, what are you going to do now with your free time? And I said, I think I'm going to get into my genealogy and I'm going to write a cemetery blog. And he said, "Okay, well, that should keep you busy for about three months. So (laughs) February marked my 10th anniversary. And I just I love doing it. I'm not doing it as much as I wish I was right now. But I love going out and finding the stories, finding the stones that that share enough that kind of encourage me to find out who this person was, find the story about them. Uh, There's a lot of abbreviations and symbols, as you mentioned, and that's what I'm working on for my second book is really digging into that and finding out what these mean, these very obscure things that you look at and you don't understand. And for me, just like you said, it is the research. It is the curiosity of what is that stone trying to to tell me? Uh, We had the Victorians in the 1800s. I have several blogs about the fact that they love secrets Mm -hmm. and they had their own um, secret language. Even with flowers, uh, a gentleman gives you a white rose. It means something completely different than if he gives you a red rose or a yellow rose. And you had to know what the flower meant and what the color meant. (laughs) kind of read in all that language. They did the same thing with their gravestone. So you look at those stones and you wonder what the symbol means, what they're telling you about that. And it's great to try to decipher that information. And then I love to get online and see if I can find out a little more about them, what their history was, their family, 
and kind of put together what their life was like. And of course, extrapolated out what was going on in that community at that time and gain more of a, of a well-rounded universe for them to see how they lived. And, and that's especially fun with your relatives to find out where they lived and what they were doing and how, how their lives were shaped at that point in time when they were there. Exactly. It makes wonderful stories. And, and folks can read uh, the stories that Joy has written over at it's joyneighbors.com, right? That's how we get there? Uh, that is how you get to my webpage. Okay. If you want to read the blog, it is a graveinterest.blogspot.com. Awesome. And that'll take you there. Good. We'll have that in the show notes for everybody as well. Uh, of course, you find show notes over at genealogygems.com. And um, there we'll have all the most recent episodes, including this one. Joy, it's always so much fun to talk to you. And I love your stories. Thank you so much for sharing. Happy travels on the road. And we'll look forward to seeing what you come up with in the coming year. Thank you so much. I love talking to you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Me too. Talk to you later. All right. Bye-bye.